Thank you very much. I, I hate hiding behind lecterns. It's great to be with you this morning um, in County Hall, which is one of the uh, uh, has a huge um, uh, symbolism in the history of London government, which was the first really serious attempt in the 19th century to build systematic London infrastructure. Uh, and a lot of what we see around us today is, is thanks to what was the London County Council and then the Greater London Council and now the Mayor of London, without which, for example, Crossrail wouldn't be happening now. So a very, very important theme in the development of infrastructure is, is very powerful subnational government. And it's no accident that the parts of the country it, which have the best infrastructure planning are those which also have the best subnational government as well as national government. London has by far the most powerful and effective subnational government of uh, anywhere in England because of the Mayor of London, the Greater London Authority, and Transport for London. Uh, and it's, surprise, surprise, it also has by far the best quality infrastructure and best quality infrastructure planning. And part of, because I'm a proselytizer for change as well as somebody who tries to deliver projects, and part of what I'm seeking to do across the country at large, which I think is hugely important, is that we need all of our cities and city regions to be mirroring London in the quality of their political and administrative leadership and the extent of powers devolved from central government. They all need equivalents of the Mayor, the Greater London Authority and Transport for London if they're going to develop their own infrastructure powerful. Now, it's been one of the greatest privileges of my life over the last uh, 15 years to play a big part in the development of the next generation infrastructure. I resigned from the National Infrastructure Commission at the end of last year because the single biggest threat that I see to infrastructure, indeed to almost everything else that involves significant state um, planning and investment is Brexit. And so just a short part of political broadcast, I've just published a book, Saving Britain, on the case against Brexit. I bought a few copies. If you want to buy one afterwards, you can come up to me. <laughs> A tenor and all of the profits are going for deprived teenagers to study or volunteer in Europe. So the single best thing we can do as a community at large to uh, favour uh, uh, significant infrastructure development is to stop Brexit. I mean, to give you an example, I have, because I'm now in the, th in the thick of this, the House of Lords, my Chamber of Parliament, has spent 157 hours debating just one of the seven Brexit pieces of legislation that are going to come before us over the next six months. That is longer than the House of Lords has spent debating any single piece of legislation in its 800-year history, and that we've got a lot, lot more to come. We're debating almost nothing else at all at the moment. Thank God we got HS2, the high-speed line from London to Birmingham, which I have more to say about. I mean, we got that through just before the last election. It was the last piece of legislation to which Her Majesty gave her royal assent before the election was the London to Birmingham high-speed rail bill. Uh, I don't think we'd be able to get something as big as that through now because there was just no parliamentary time to do uh, legislation. There's a smaller bill going through now to take the line up from Birmingham to Crewe, and I hope in due course over the next 15 years we will get it up to Manchester and to Leeds, but there's nothing like the imperative there was before. So that's the bad news. The good news, though, because it's important to, to say what's going on well and the role that you can play, and the, uh, there's a very, very good news story about infrastructure in the last 10 to 15 years, is that we have got better at taking big decisions. We have significant big projects in place, and the work that you do, and in particular the collaboration that you, you bring between different parts of the industry, uh, professionals, professional bodies, the ICE, which plays a... A, a, a crucially important role in all this and the government that and both central and local that has all improved and my message to you today is just to carry on do it always in life affect the things which you can control you can control all of that and in particular the more efficient and timely your delivery of infrastructure and the more cost effective the stronger the case that people like me can make thereafter for more infrastructure Hereafter, The single biggest threat to HS2, for example, now, which is the biggest infrastructure project in Europe, isn't political now because the legislation has gone through. The single biggest threat is that this project overruns both in terms of time and money. And if we have a whole series of stories over the next 10 to 15 years on the 50 billion becoming 70 billion, becoming 100 billion, becoming 120 billion, and it's three years late, and the whole of central London is gridlocked because of the chaos at Euston and the mismanagement of the project and all of that, then I can assure you there will be no HS3 uh, or HS4. You, you may not even get HS2 up to, uh, up to Manchester and Leeds. And that is, if I may say so, very largely within your collective control. And 
I mean, there's, there's a great sort of tradition of blaming all the politicians for everything that goes wrong in this country. And by the way, I think you can blame them about 99% of what goes wrong. <laughs> they are making a huge hash of it at the moment. But when it comes to the delivery of infrastructure projects, which have been agreed by ministers and parliament, which is the case now with a lot of big projects that are going on, don't blame the officials. You need to get on with it yourself. And we have to have much better answers than we've got as infrastructure deliverers to the question, why does it cost twice as much in Britain to build a mile of high-speed line than it costs in France? There's no satisfactory answer to that. We've had PwC and others who've called all over it. We haven't got a satisfactory answer to it yet. We've got to start answering questions like that. Why is it we're about to build the most expensive nuclear power station in the history of energy? You know, why, where did that come from? Why is it that our 4G coverage, which is hugely important, that is largely the, the responsibility of the private sector to deliver through the... Through the uh, mobile phone companies, why is it that we have barely 70% 4G coverage? It's totally unreliable. You can get better coverage, as I found out, in the middle of Kampala than you can in the centre of London on 4G. And so it goes on. Now, some of those are political. In that, in that particular case, I think we have a very weak regulator, which, again, isn't the direct responsibility of the politicians. The politicians did not decree that Ofcom should be weak and useless. It is weak and useless. <laughs> that is Ofcom's fault, and it needs to put it right itself. As I say to Lord Burns, who's with me, the great thing about being in my position, I can call people like Law Burns, we can use this because we're on a par. You can't, I suspect. Uh, but somebody needs to say that that is the case because otherwise we will not get this sorted and we do need to get it sorted as a country. There are a whole lot of things that, that need to happen. So if I can, because I've just got uh, uh, 15 minutes, take three big themes. Firstly, don't worry about the decisions we've still got to take. There are a lot of them. Concentrate big time on the ones that are there and make them work. Now, uh, and there are, we're better at those than you may think. Parliament next week is going to be voting on Heathrow. Now, the reason why Heathrow is an exception to what I've just said about nothing happening because of Brexit is because, thank goodness, we've persuaded the Cabinet that Heathrow expansion is all the more imperative with Brexit because you cannot have a narrative about Britain being open to the wider world and trading with the, you know, I mean, Liam Fox, who apparently has accumulated more air miles in pursuit of the impossible than anybody else, but you certainly can't have more trade treaties or a, a narrative of engagement with the wider world beyond Europe unless you can get to it. And Heathrow has two runways. Charles de Gaulle has four runways. Frankfurt has four runways. Schiphol has six runways. Uh, Dubai is building a completely new international airport over and above their current one, which already has more passengers per year than Heathrow and has overtaken it as the biggest hub airport in the world. Now, that simply isn't a narrative that can be sustained. We've spent the best part of 25 years debating whether or not we should uh, have a third runway at Heathrow. I took a decision as Secretary of State for Transport 10 years ago that it should happen. It was reversed by the following government. There was then a committee of inquiry which spent three years under Sir Howard Davis getting back to square one again, saying that maybe it was the right thing to build the third runway after all. The Cabinet has spent three and a half years now debating that. And they are now, next week, they have taken a decision, because I'm, I'm paying tribute to Mrs May on this, they took a decision two weeks ago that they were going to do it. It goes to Parliament next week. I'd be very surprised if it doesn't go ahead. Now, again, the big job for your industry then is to see that it happens in a timely and effective manner. And it is a very big and complicated infrastructure project. So it involves not only what is, in fact, quite a straightforward business, which is building, uh, laying the tarmac for a new runway. Also, it requires really significant relocations of, of uh, road, the road networks, big works on the M25, new terminal facilities. It has to dovetail in with the opening of Crossrail, which is happening in six months' time. Almost certainly in due course, there'll need to be a western rail access and a southern rail access too. All of that, managing all of that in a timely and effective way so that it, there isn't huge disruption at and around Heathrow, that we don't have massive environmental consequences and that this is seen to be a success is going to be hugely important for infrastructure projects hereafter. And it's particularly important that air passengers and the clients of Heathrow, of uh, which the most important by far is British Airways, which is campaigning hard against the third runway because it says that the costs are out of control and it's going to lead to a big increase in landing charges. It's vital that those arguments are proved wrong because at the moment they are not emphatically wrong, I have to tell you. At the moment the costs are through the roof. It does look as if there will be an increase in landing charges despite what the government has said unless there's going to be huge public subsidy and that could get this whole narrative into a very poor place. So again a lot of that lies with the industry to see that that is, uh, is got right and those who work in partnership with Heathrow Airport Limited. But that's a good decision and a hugely important one. 
Crossrail opens in six months' time. That has been a, a fair success story, and provided we can sort out, which is a semi-political thing, what happens to all the disbursements from Crossrail in central London, where numbers coming out of Bond Street, Sutton Court Road are going to double, and there's going to be huge congestion issues there. If that can all be sorted, then I think this will be seen as, as a success. Uh, HS2, which is the next biggest uh, project after that, uh, there are 1,000 staff in HS2 Limited, it, right next to Snow Hill Station in, uh, in their headquarters in Birmingham. Uh, this is a very important project, not only for the country, but also for the rebalancing of the country too. It's extremely significant that HS2 Limited is based in Birmingham and not in London. It's the first time we've had a massive national project of this kind that hasn't basically been led from and by uh, London. Seeing this as it needs to be seen as dramatically re-energising and empowering the regions is, is hugely important. And that's true in commercial terms, in terms of the actual construction of the project, as well as the impact that it will have when it's open. So having the HS2 colleges in Doncaster and in Birmingham, which will train the next generation of, of, of workers uh, on this project, learning from the lessons of the Tunnelling Academy from Crossrail, because uh, uh, about half of this line going out to Birmingham is tunnel. It's important to understand because all the concessions that had to be made to the NIMBYs, HS2 going to Birmingham is essentially an extension of the Northern Line. It just goes <laughs> into a tunnel almost the entire way through the Chilterns. I mean, I traded some tunnels when I was Secretary of State. My successors, every time they faced NIMBYs uh, coming through, they gave another few miles of tunnel. So it goes, which is a huge, huge pity, because the best way of appreciating the Chilterns is actually to be able to see it. And being able to see it from the train, as you can if you go on the Chiltern line itself, is, is magnificent. No one's going to see the Chilterns, because all we're going to see is a tunnel. And also, by the way, these trains, so this is a part of political broadcast for HS2 coming up now, these, these trains are fabulously beautiful. People in Kent who see HS1 and the Eurostars going through, they do not say that this is a blot on the landscape, we don't want any of that. They think they are beautiful, they're wonderful, they love them. And the great tragedy of what's happened in the Chilterns is that the people who would have benefited most are the passengers who would have seen the Chilterns, who would have opened up this area of outstanding natural beauty, and of course the residents of the Chilterns themselves who would have fallen in love with these trains. <laughs> and I, I, uh, but anyway, those decisions have been taken, but we need to learn that for the extension of the line up to Manchester and Leeds, that, the, that these aren't somehow um, blots on the landscape, these are great things. But getting all that work underway now and making it cost effective is hugely important and seeing and demonstrating that this is a project which is going to really engage apprentices and the skill base, particularly in the Midlands and the North, is hugely important for the whole success of the project, making a success of these colleges is hugely important uh, and, as I say, keeping the project on time and uh, on budget is, uh, is, is hugely important too. If we can make a success of HS2, and it's seen to be a success, then the case for a, a whole number of really significant projects, if we can afford them post-Brexit, that will then become, uh, extre become much, much stronger. In particular, Crossrail too, because London, if London is not going to be a city going into decline, which it may be, but if it's going to be a city which can continue uh, uh, growing, then we will need HS2, which, uh, so Crossrail 2, which goes north-south, which will go from Wimbledon through to... Uh, 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 to Clapham Junction, uh, Victoria, Tottenham Court Road, connection with HS2 at Euston and then through to the North East. That will be hugely important, has massive regeneration potential because it will open up the Upper Lee Valley, which is the most undeveloped part of London at the moment. You could have a few hundred thousand houses there and new settlements. The decisions on that have been delayed by the government because they're not sure that they can afford it with Brexit, they don't say it like that, but that's what's going on at the moment. So they're having their third review of funding at the moment. Well, the only issue on funding is whether the Chancellor will agree or won't agree to sign the cheque, and that doesn't take very long. But we'll go through this review that will last two or three years, and one of the big factors in it, I think, will be what's actually happening in terms of the cost effectiveness and the management of, of HS2, because Crossrail 2, if it happens, will es essentially be built in tandem with HS2, so that is uh, hugely important. What's going on in the, with, in the north? Well, the problem at the north at the moment is that no one's cap capable of getting even any ex of the existing trains running at all. And that's before they made these catastrophic timetable changes. This line called the Trans-Pennine Express is the greatest offence against the Trade Descriptions Act, I'm told, apart, apart from my own name. So you need, <laughs> you, need, you need to think about that for a moment. But it's called the Trans-Pennine Express. Le Leeds to Manchester is only 40 miles. And the Trans-Pennine Express takes an hour to do it. And the, uh, the, the impact that this has in reducing the economic... Because you could have a, a, a massive agglomeration effect across the Pennines between Manchester and Leeds and their, and their, and their conurbations if you could 
get to and from them. I mean, this, the distance between the two is less than the distance between the two ends of the central line in London, but the central line runs every two minutes, has, well, not a very reliable service, still has old trains and they were very badly built in the 1980s, but it's nonetheless okay as a service, uh, whereas you have uh, an absolutely hopeless trans service even before, even when the trains were running. They're not running at all at the moment. So when they were running, it was still pretty bad and the infrastructure was, was terrible. And what we need is an east, what's um, the crossrail of the north that will go Liverpool, Manchester, Bradford, Leeds, and then to the northeast up to uh, York and Newcastle and due east across to Hull. And that needs to be a kind of metro line which could transform the connectivity between these medium-sized uh, cities. The biggest obstacle holding them back is the inability to agglomerate because we don't have state-of-the-art infrastructure between them. But whether those decisions are taken will, in my judgment, very substantially turn on whether HS2 is seen as a success in terms of, um, of delivery as it develops over the next few years or a failure. If it's seen as a success, I think there'll be big appetite amongst the politicians to take on new projects of that kind, particularly in the two big areas which are, where, where there's massive bottlenecks at the moment, or potential bottlenecks, which is London, if London continues to grow, and the North, which we need uh, whatever happens at the moment, because they, it's such a, they're so, the, the economic challenges facing it are, are so great, and they're partly because of substandard infrastructure. So those are projects uh, which are new, and where you have a crucial part to play. We still have a huge issue in improving infrastructure, which is supposedly in place at the moment, but not functioning properly, which is my second priority. Now, a lot of that is by virtue of the fact that so much of our infrastructure is Victorian. Uh, most of our rail infrastructure, of course, is, is Victorian. Indeed, as I like to say, part of it is pre-Victorian. The London and Birmingham Railway was opened for the coronation of Queen Victoria in 1938. So it's nearly 200 years old. It's an absolute miracle of, of engineering and the ability to constantly re-engineer that it works at all. There are only four miles of the, of the whole West Coast main line from London to Manchester, which are straight because it was all built around landowners' estates, many of them sitting in my House of Parliament at the moment, because it was impossible to get the Parliament to agree to this line if it didn't circumvent the, uh, the estates, which is why we had to have the tilting trains and all of that. Now, it's part of the reason for HS2, of course, it's powerful reason is that there's a massive capacity constraint, but keeping this ancient infrastructure, because it is ancient now, going and modernising it is a huge continuing challenge. And that applies to the sewerage systems of the country. Uh, we're doing the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is looking to be a very good project in terms of effectiveness and all of that, but it, it, nonetheless it's, uh, it's, um, it's being bolted onto an existing and very old uh, sewerage system. I mean, it was Sir Joseph Bazalgette, who was one, in one way, in some ways, I think, the, the single greatest infrastructure planner in the history of this country, who built the Victorian sewerage system to have double the capacity which was required in the mid-Victorian period, because he said that London was going to be an expanding city and it was going to be the great city of the empire and it needed proper infrastructure. I mean, they, they didn't do... Um, treasury cost-benefit analyses which said that if something hasn't paid back within 24 years you don't do it then. I mean they were much bigger and bolder but the big challenge for you is how do you graft this old infrastructure into modern requirements and make it work effectively. A lot of the infrastructure which isn't working there at the moment isn't particularly old, it just hasn't been very well established and the really serious uh, issue we've got, to, to my mind at the moment, in that respect, is, is our digital infrastructure. Our digital infrastructure on almost every study is at the back end of quality in terms of developed nations, at the very severe back end in terms of mobile quality, because there was an, an unsatisfactory trade-off was done between quality and extent of infrastructure and price, in my view. It's no good having very cheap mobile phone bills if you can't actually make any calls and that balance hasn't been got right and needs to be and that's an industry problem because the industry itself shouldn't have made all kinds of false claims about what it was going to be able to do with substandard infrastructure but it's also a regulatory mistake and we need to get all of that together. The same is unfortunately true in broadband. We make ever more grand statements about what's going to happen with super and ultra fast broadband. The problem is they're just not delivered. You know, I mean, large parts of London have really terrible um, uh, super fast broadband uh, coverage unless you have fiber to the premises which of course is largely the prerogative of of, uh, of larger businesses and the city and uh, and canary wharf now getting that sorted out is, uh, is is hugely important too the third issue which is important is uh, is is getting this balance between quality and price right one of our biggest problems uh, in getting agreement to big infrastructure upgrades and new projects so far is this view 
the costs are completely out of control and huge. And in, when I was chairing the National Infrastructure Commission, the biggest arguments I had with the Treasury and with the industry and with the regulators weren't in fact to do with the worthwhileness of particular projects, because they very rarely disputed those. It was the, the complete and deep scepticism that anything could be delivered at anything like the advertised uh, price and time scale. And uh, uh, though we've got some big achievements to our name, like Crossrail, um, and the delivery of the Olympics and uh, s some of the uh, uh, associated infrastructure. We don't have a strong enough tradition in the tr tradition of, of great infrastructure, countries that have been great at infrastructure delivery, which the two foremost, I would say, uh, well, three are France, Germany, and um, and Japan, uh, we haven't yet got to anything like uh, that level of, uh, of perceived competence and reliability. Now, the National Infrastructure Commission itself, which I had the privilege to chair, was seeking to try and depoliticize these issues and develop a, a, a much stronger debate with the industry using the expertise which has been de de developed by the IPA and others to get planning uh, in a better place and a much greater perception um, and reality of competence. But I tell you, quite frankly, we've got a lot further to go. It's not remotely the case that Britain is regarded as the place to go if you want to understand uh, effective, timely, and cost-effective delivery of infrastructure. I don't know of anyone who comes here seriously to look at that. We spend our time going and looking what others do in that respect. We've got, uh, we have managed to deliver, and you know, I mean, I just could, I could bore for this for the next hour, just going on about it. You know, HS. One is the single most expensive piece of infrastructure for per mile uh, of a railway delivered anywhere in the world, apart from HS2. <laughs> Crossrail is excellent, but Crossrail is the most expensive metro line that's been delivered in the world per mile. We, uh, we have, um, and, and a lot of these things have been massively uh, uh, gold-plated, well, you know, I mean, many of you who work in the sector will know, that because there wasn't a trade-off which was done at a, at a, at a, uh, in, in the right way between uh, investments and, um, uh, and cost. Things weren't done properly to budgets, they were done to wish lists, which is partly because we don't have the people who are delivering engaged early enough in the whole process of design, but also because our politicians have the faintest clue what engineering is, because none of them are engineers. I and mean, we can go on and on about what the problems are. But uh, I mean, I'm not an engineer, I'm a historian, so I have the faintest clue about a lot of the things you talk about. As soon as you develop descend into double dutch, you lose me completely. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You do need some historians, but it would be nice to have one or two engineers at the top of the civil service and government, and there aren't any at all at the moment. They're all historians, or even worse, PPEs, because that's just a degree in rhetoric. So it's, it's a really serious set of problems we've got at the moment. But getting, when we talk about this partnership, which we talk, which we've talked about, which is so important within your industry, it also needs to be a wider partnership with society, with decision makers, with civil servants, and so on. So one of my messages to you is that um, uh, there are good things and bad things going on at the moment, but concentrate on things within your control. And the thing I perceive to be within your control is making a reality of strong collaborative working, but not for its own sake, though it's important in terms of delivering your projects, but you need to regard yourself as part of a wider public purpose to make the case to society at large that we can deliver infrastructure in a timely, cost-effective way, that it can transform society at large, this isn't just now infrastructure projects, and that we need more of it to be a thoroughly modern, developed, future-looking country into the next generation. Thank you very much.